So our day continues here at the Mount Cuba Center uh, Trial Gardens with Sam Hoadley, who is the Trial Garden Manager. And he's going to give us a little bit of background on what happens at the Trial Gardens, and then we're going to see these fantastic plants and talk about which ones have really performed well. So yeah, this is the Trial Garden. This is where we evaluate native plants for garden and wildlife value. This used to be the cut flower garden, uh, Mrs. Copeland's cut flower garden, and since 2002 we've been doing native plant trials here. Um, behind us we have several of our trials that are going on right now. Generally a trial lasts three to four years, um, depending on the longevity of a plant. If it's a longer lived plant like Baptisia, we'll give it an extra year. And our first foray into woody plants, Hydrangea arborescens and its allies, we've given it an additional year, so that's going to be a, a five year trial. Um, that trial is going to be ending really quick, really soon. Um, we'll be releasing a report in December. And the other ongoing trials are Carex, Solidago, which is our most recently planted trial, and Ironweeds, or Vernonias. And I know the one you finished last year was Echinacea. Can you tell us about that trial? Absolutely, yeah. So we evaluated 75 different Echinacea um, cultivars, hybrids, and species, and we compared them all horticulturally, and we also compared them on their ability to attract pollinators. We found some really interesting, interesting results. Um, we actually did a Echinacea trial in the past. I think it ran from 2007 to 2009. And it was fascinating to see some of the top performing plants were again top performers in our most recent trial. So over the last decade there's been a lot of introductions and they all held up really well um, amongst those really new and improved um, echinacea cultivars. So at the end of a three or four year trial we compose the final results in a research report. Now these are the hard copies are available here for free. Um, you can pick them up when you visit the gardens, but all of these are also available on, as PDF versions on our website. Um, this is the most recent research report that we, that we produced. Um, it came out in late December, early January of this past year. And what we do in these research reports is we highlight some of the top performers from our previous trial. Generally we do 10, but in this case we did 12 because there were a lot of really top performing plants. But we also heavily feature a pollinator component. Um, with Echinacea, we were very, very interested in the difference, um, especially between single flowered or wild type Echinacea compared to the double flowered or pom pom type Echinacea. We, were sus we had the suspicion early on that the double flowered Echinacea would attract less pollinators because um, the idea being is that there's less value and less reward for the pollinators there. Anytime there's a double flower, there's a chance that those, some of the reproductive organs are replaced by tissue that is more similar to a petal, and that replacement oftentimes, or can, um, substitute out the showy um, for the benefit of the pollinators. So those double flowers are really for us, um, and we, for the beauty in the garden, but we wanted to see if they had any pollinator value at all. And over two years of our pollinator studies, we found um, that they had very, very low pollinator value. At least they, were, they had much lower attraction for pollinators than the single type plants. There's a lot going on in this chart, but here the, the green bars represent the wild type or single flowered echinacea, and the red bars represent the double flowered echinacea. You can see the visitations are much, much lower. They're all down in this bottom quarter here. If you want to see more information or more details on this, check out the report on the website. So behind me we have the Amsonia trial. This is actually our longest running trial here in the trial garden. All these plants were put in in 2014 and we're hoping to have some results of this in the coming year. Um, Amsonia are really a wonderful genus. You kind of can't go wrong. I haven't met an Amsonia that I don't like. They're long-lived plants, deer resistant, um, super tough. If you give them full sun, you get multiple seasons of interest. You get this beautiful flowering in May to early June. Some of them are even a little bit earlier. And um, then you get some good fall color, especially from Amsoni hubrichtii. It has this beautiful golden fall color, um, really giving it an extra season of interest. Um, one of the most interesting findings from this um, trial um, is this comparison between Amsonia blue ice and Amsonia orientalis. Amsonia blue ice is an extremely common plant, uh, often sold as a native, um, and what we've found is that Amsonia orientalis here, which is actually native to southeastern Europe, these two plants are almost identical. Um, and we actually believe that they are the same exact species, or at least a very, very similar hybrid. Um, so in our opinion, Amsonia blue ice, yeah, we don't consider that to be a native plant. Still a good garden plant, but if you're um, a native plant purist, this wouldn't have a place um, in your garden. 
So in the back row here, we have a lot of the larger Amsonia species and hybrids. Um, these, these plants can almost take the, the place of a shrub and a foundation planting. Obviously, it's gonna die back to the ground um, in, the, in the fall and in the early winter, and it can be cut back at that point. Um, but it's just a really, really great plant. Again, gives you a lot of great texture in the garden, gives you a good presence, and it's a plant that's never going to overwhelm your house, won't take a lot of pruning um, like a woody plant would to kind of keep it in bounds. Um, these are a few hybrids here, and then over here are some of the other varieties of Amsonia Tabernay Montana, including Illustrious, Salicifolia, and regular variety Tabernay Montana. All great plants. So some of these really compact plants are great, perfect for a smaller garden space. Fortunately, a few of these aren't as commercially available as they once were, but really worth trying to, to seek out if you can. Um, a couple of these cultivars, including Montana, Short Stack, which was offered by Plantalites, and Dwarf Form. They're essentially bringing you everything that a regular Tabernay Montana does, but in a smaller package. So in this corner of the trial garden, we have some of our previous top performers, but more importantly, we have a few of our past intros, including the five plants here that are part of our newly branded Mount Cuba collection. Now these five plants um, really represent what we think are some of our best introductions from the past and some of these plants that are more commercially available today. Uh, most recently, we introduced this plant, Iris, Pur Iris Versicolor Purple Flame. It's a plant that's been in our garden for a very long time. Um, the original plant is currently down by the ponds. You can see that there. But the best thing about this plant is that eggplant purple new foliage that comes up in spring. It looks amazing with plants like marsh marigolds, uh, wood poppies. That, that yellow and purple contrast is really stunning. As the weather starts to warm, you lose some of that purple coloration, but then you get these really beautiful purple scapes of, of, for the, of the flowers, and these flowers will begin to bloom in late May into June. Um, this is a really, really great plant, can handle really wet soils and also fairly average garden conditions in full sun and part shade. So this is another one of our introductions that's part of our newly branded Mount Cuba collection. Um, this is Coreopsis Tripterus Gold Standard. This was a seedling from a seed collection that we made in Alabama. And we noticed that this seedling had a more compact habit, very sturdy stems, and a really long bloom period, and really peaking kind of mid to late August. Um, so we actually included this plant in our Coreopsis trial, and it was trialed amongst many other well-established well plants, um, commercially available Coreopsis, and this ended up being one of our top performers, and we decided it needed to be commercially introduced. Um, what really sets it apart from regular Coreopsis tripterus um, is that it gets about five feet tall. Again, it's a little bit shorter than the straight species, and it really never needs staking. The stems are very, very sturdy, blooms for a very long time in late summer into, into early fall really superior plant. Um, there's a place for this in any home garden. So in this corner of the trial garden we have featured a few of our best performing flocks from our previous flocks trial. Um, Phlox paniculata gina was a standout for a couple of reasons. It was one of the best plants horticulturally speaking, absolutely clean foliage as far as powdery mildew is concerned, but we also looked at all these flocks um, for their ability to attract butterflies in particular. And flocks are well known to attract butterflies, but for some reason Phlox paniculata gina attracted far, far more than all of the other flocks in the trial by a factor of three or four times. Um, Phlox paniculata gina, it's, um, its flowers are very small, and but there seems to be more of them per panicle. We did compare um, sugar concentrations and nectar volumes and to see if there's any difference between this plant and other uh, Phlox paniculata that might explain the difference between uh, butterfly visitations. And we found that there really was very little difference. The thinking now is that there's just so many flowers per square inch more than regular Phlox paniculata that butterflies are able to sit in one place and feed off of many more flowers than they normally would. If you want butterflies in your home garden, this is the plant to pick. Um, it's really, really spectacular. We have some planted in our formal garden and they are absolutely covered in tiger swallowtails um, in the, the middle summer. So I'm currently standing in our Hydrangea arborescence trial and we've included a couple different species in this as well, Hydrangea cinerea and Hydrangea radiata. Um, essentially all the native hydrangeas to the east coast that bloom on new wood. And what that means is essentially those buds are produced that growing season so you can prune these really hard in early spring, which is what we've done here, and you'll still get reliable flowers from them. We have done a cutback study with each of these different hydrangeas. Uh, in late March, we cut one of these almost completely to the, to the ground and we compare it to a plant that hasn't been cut back or pruned in any way. 
Um, we're seeing some interesting trends, which I'm really excited to share with you in that report. And uh, a few of the sneak preview things about this is what, what we're seeing is that there's a slight delay in flowering on the cutback plants. Um, plants tend to be a slightly smaller, a little bit more manageable in a, in your, in a smaller landscape. Um, but the biggest take home piece of this is that you get generally get fewer flowers, but flowers that are larger in diameter than plants that are unpruned. Um, and they're, it's really a fascinating treatment. They're just a great reliable bloomer. Um, they're super cold hardy and there's no worries about those buds being frosted um, like you would get with hydrangea macrophylla. These will bloom no matter what in June and July. Yes, and hydrangeas are such a popular garden plant and um, we have so many natives that would perform wonderfully. So Sam, can you tell us about some of your favorites here? Absolutely. Um, so essentially, the, at least our trials are broken out into two big groups. Um, there's our mop heads, which are really the big cloud form hydrangea flowers. And then your, you have your lace caps, which are the more wild types, where you have all those fertile flowers in the middle with the um, sterile or bracted flowers on the exterior. Um, the ones that I really like are the lace caps. Um, I just like the look of them, but I also like their ability to attract pollinators. Um, one plant in particular, Haas Halo, which is a cultivar of hydrangea arborescence that was selected in Pennsylvania, um, is absolutely unbelievable in its ability to attract pollinators. In June and July, it is absolutely covered with bumblebees, flies, beetles. There's so much activity going on in that plant. And when you look at a plant like Annabelle, there's hardly any pollinator activity at all. Um, when I have a plant in my home garden, it has to have some kind of benefit for wildlife and Haas Halo absolutely checks that box. So in addition to typical hydrangea arborescence, which is the plant that most of the commercially available cultivars is derived from, we also have hydrangea cinerea, which actually used to be um, lumped into hydrangea arborescence. It was variety discolor. Um, but now it's been split out into its own species. Very, very similar to hydrangea arborescence, behaves similarly in the garden, perhaps a little bit more compact, um, maybe better for smaller spaces. Um, but we, the difference here is the, kind of this fuzzy pubescence on the stem here in the back of the leaves. This is a really, really great plant for pollinators, um, but actually fairly infrequently encountered in the trade. Another plant that we absolutely love is Hydrangea radiata. And this, you can see that beautiful silvery back to that leaf. This is one of its key ID features. Um, it's a really, really fascinating plant. Again, not as widely available as it should be, um, but there actually are a couple cultivars that are derived from this as well that have more of the mop head type flowers. Um, the straight species is wonderful, great for pollinators as well. Um, I will say that as far as sun tolerance, um, hydrangea arborescence, or, or it used to be a hydrangea arborescence variety radiata, but now it's hydrangea radiata, um, is probably one of the less um, sun tolerant plants in our trial. Um, and is generally one of the first to wilt in drier conditions. This will be much more, ha much more at home in part sun um, in soils that don't dry out as often. So behind me is our Carex trial. This is actually slated to be released next year, um, the results from this trial. We have 73 different Carex in our trial. Some of the ones behind me, these are all in full sun. And then we also have an additional set in the shade here in our shade structure. Really in the full sun, we're kind of pushing the tolerances of a lot of these plants, although some of them have been absolutely spectacular in the full sun as well. And we'll be featuring that heavily in our research report. Carex are definitely an underused plant. Um, there's a ton of uses for them um, in landscapes as a replacement for lawns. And some of them are even um, great for living mulch or even specimen plants. And there's a couple of them here that are definitely worth pointing out now. They're, some of their best features are on display in kind of early May and even late April. So a few of the plants that have done really well in full sun are uh, Carex pensylvanica and this cultivar of Carex pensylvanica by Intrinsic Perennials called Straw Hat. It's a little less of a, of a mat forming plant. It's a little bit more of a clumper, but really, really attractive flowers. They've kind of passed now, but it still gives you that nice texture. And again, really tolerant of full sun. It's done beautifully in the shade as well. This is more typical Carex pensylvanica here. You can see definitely a more matte forming version of the species, um, but really, again, very sun tolerant, a great um, alternative for some lawns and even just as a living mulch, it'll surround other perennials without out competing them. 
And then another great mat forming and rhizomata species is Carex woodii. It kind of has this bluish cast to the foliage, much tighter rhizomes, really makes a very solid planting. Again, won't outcompete other smaller native perennials. Um, and the flowers are absolutely spectacular. They have these beautiful golden yellow straw colored flowers above the foliage. Um, really late April is, is kind of the peak for them. This is definitely um, a worthwhile plant for, for seeking out for your home landscape. So a couple more plants that are really worth mentioning uh, for their sun tolerance as well as just their overall garden worthiness. Carex cherokeensis is one of my absolute favorites in this trial. A little slow to emerge in the spring, but it has a ton of staying power. Really good evergreen plant. Um, flowers are interesting, but the foliage is really what you grow this plant for. It's a larger size Carex has a really really good presence in the garden good grass replacement again very flexible in the landscape full sun or partial shade this will definitely be one of our top performers in our upcoming trial report and carex springellii a little bit more of an upright plant but again has done really well in full sun and in shade um, has these really interesting seed heads kind of that evoke thoughts of almost of like a grain. Um, interesting movement in the landscape and a little bit of a breeze, very upright, really worthwhile in a, in a home garden. And one of my favorite Carex in our entire trial at the moment is Carex haydenii. It's a very upright plant, very vase shaped. Um, this almost is a specimen plant to me um, and can take, kind of take the similar um, place in a garden that a miscanthus or something like that would take. The flowers are really attractive. They're a little bit past now, but it retains this kind of upright vase-like um, foliage, really intense, very powdery blue foliage in the early spring when it's coming up, totally deciduous plant. And it's done so beautifully in the sun and the shade. This is definitely worth, um, worth growing and deserves to be wider, more widely cultivated. Gardeners, be sure to watch part one of Native Plant Channel's Garden Tour of Mount Cuba Center, where you're going to get to see a wide variety of native plants, some that will grow in sun, but many that will grow in shady woodland conditions. So I hope you have enjoyed this tour of Mount Cuba Center, which is really one of the premier places for uh, native plant gardeners to visit, to learn so much. Um, one of the very few places that conducts research and shares that research with the public. So Sam, I just want to give you um, such a great thank you for what you have uh, shown us today, for how you have helped us today. It's really been a pleasure. Native Plant Channel is so happy to be here, so excited to be able to share this with all our native plant gardeners. Well, pleasure's all, pleasure's all mine. Thank you for coming and uh, thanks for having me. Okay, yeah. thank you gardeners and just have a great day and get out there and add some more of the native plants to your garden.